Whatever it is, I won't do it. Do you hear? The doctor spun himself around as he yelled at the, to the heavens, holding on to his hat, his enormous multicolored scarf fanning out around him. I won't, I won't, I won't. The heavens did not respond. It was evening wherever he was, and a pleasant one at that. A rolling countryside of grass and small knots of delicate floor, ending at the sheer cliff that fell away into the wide expansions of the oceans. A light breeze in a warm climate spoke of a lazy summer night. Behind him, a beat-up blue police box stood dark and silent. In the distance, a high boots of exposed rocks flowers high into the air, overheard of a large moon illuminating the landscape in a ghostly pallor. If you think I don't know the difference between a navigational error and a deliberate interference, you're mistaken. He walked over to the smooth boulder, raised out of the ground, and sat there. He took off his hat and ran his hand through his shock of curly brown hair. The lanky alien could almost hear her voice. Oh, doctor, you're being childish again. He opened his mouth to reply before realizing once again that she was gone. They traveled together for so long, he had trouble remembering that it was like to wander the universe alone. He felt empty. That much he knew. It hurt, but he would not allow himself to recognize it. A bag of jelly babies appeared in his hands. He looked at it as if he had never seen it before and shoved it ruthlessly back into his pocket. He stood up. Well, at least it isn't scary and it doesn't look like Karen. His most recent mission for the Time Lords had been unpleasant, at least when they sent him the Scarrow. They had the decency to tell him they were about, were on, on Karen. They had just dumped him into the meat grinder, him and Sarah. There it was again, the emptiness. He drove it away with the fond memories of adventures they had with Harry. Clumsy, ham-fisted idiot, he said with a grin. Harry was probably having tea with Bridget and Sarah. Well, she was in South Cora, Corden. That's where he left her. Well, it sure looks like South Cord anyway. He, he he equivated. He had thought about going back to get her, but st with disturbing frequencies. Why not? They could pick up right where they left off. After all, Gallifrey was saved. The master was dead. Probably dead. And he had earned his freedom. In fact, he was now president, Lord President of Gallifrey. Couldn't he do whatever he wanted? But he didn't. Let her move on with her life while there is still time. Solitude would get him nowhere. He walked over the, to the cliff edge and peered over the placed sea. The steady beak of the surface hun surf, hundreds of feet below, spoke of a deep sleep and a vivid dream. He kicked a stone over the edge and heard it bounce around before hitting the bottom of the beach. What he needed was a distraction. As if on command, the sound of soft moaning broke his reverie. A grin broke out across his face, stuffing his hat back on his head and marched in the directions of the unhappy noise. A short distance away, he saw a young boy, perhaps twelve or thirteen, sitting amongst the roots of an ancient tree. He had a bare, he was bare-chested, but wore green, 
gray pantaloons with a dark maroon sash. He for his forehead, however, bore a telltale tail arrowhead tattoo, partially covered as if it was had been short, dark, and curly. It had been a lifetime since he'd seen one of the, like that. Why, hello there, young airbender. The boy looked at him, dark circle eyes. His eyes stood mute, testimony in, to his predicament. I see, can't sleep, eh? Shaking his head, the boy replied, No, I can't, ter it's terrible. I'm so tired, but I can't sleep. Every time I do, I have these horrible hallucinations, really. I'm just waiting for Appa or Momo to sit up and start talking to me. His voice, innocent and unbroken, nevertheless carried with it the weight of a worldly care. A bag of candy reappeared. Appa and Momo, eh? The Time Lord repeated sympathetically. Here, yeah, have a jelly, baby. The boy looked up at him, an expression of uncertainty. They're quite good, the elder man said, taking out one and popping into his mouth. Yeah, try one. I'm sorry, sir. I don't want to be rude, but who are you? The, air the young airbender was exhausted, but curious, with only the brightest trace of suspicious. This was true to form. form. Airbenders were trusting a lot. That was one of the reasons they had been easily exterminated. Yes, he remembered the, that tragedy, but perhaps that was in the future. Oh, I'm sorry. Hello. Here I am offering you a jelly baby before I've even offered you my name. The words came out in a terror tumble, as they often did, but they did the young boy some comfort because he smiled in return. I'm the doctor. I'm called the doctor. I'm a traveler, you see. And you are... Uh, oh, uh, I'm Kuzan, the boy replied, taking a jelly baby. Kuzan! The doctor mar marveled at the obvious lie. Kuzan, I'm delighted to meet you, he said, shaking the boy's hand. The boy ate the candy, but the smile faded from his face as the exhausted... Exhaustions once again exerted its iron grip. Suddenly the boy's eyes went wide with fear and suspicion. Hey, wait. How did you know I'm a... Uh, oh. The bandana laid next to him where he had dropped it. Sokka would kill him if he found out he'd blown his cover. Like this. But then the island was supposed to be deserted. The boy sat up and examined the stranger closely. He was tall, wore strange clothes, clothes, a brown overcoat, gray pants, a very indeterminable color in the failing light. Strange of all the um, enormous patches, quilt scarfs he wore. He didn't look like he was from the Fire Nation, but he had to know for sure. Pardon me, but, uh, are you from the Fire Nation? But me, the doctor laughed in joy, reply, pointing at himself and putting a jelly baby back into his pockets. Why, my dear old chap, of course not. I haven't been in the Fire Nation for an, oh, three hundred years. The boy looked confused. You're in the Fire Nation right now. I am? Yes, you mean you really don't know that? No, not at all. I assure you, like I said, I'm a traveler. But why are you so concerned? I might be from the Fire Nation, eh? If you already aren't? Well, the boy clearly hadn't fought the lines of questioning through. He looked down at his feet, which were curled inwards. Since he was clearly, relu clearly reluctant to elaborate, the, boy des the doctor decided to change the subject. Don't worry about that now, hmm. Let's talk about your prob other problems. But then, of course, they might be related. Why you can't sleep? Why can't you sleep? Can you tell me that? The boy thought for a moment then before replying. I guess they were kind of related, but... You're a doctor, right? Maybe you can help me. The doctor forced 
out a la large breath. He didn't want to mislead the boy. Well, my doctorian is purely honorary, but maybe I could can help if you tell me what the problem is. The boy suddenly got up. His face stretched tightly from the stress and began waving his arms around in an animated fashion. I have to do something that's really hard. I don't and if I don't do it, a lot of people are going to get hurt. People really care about. And a lot of other people I don't even know. Oh, I know the feeling, the Time Lord replied automatically. The boy st stopped gesturing to observe his new companion. You do? Yes, the doctor commissioned a bit absently. I find myself in that kind of situation all too often, I'm afraid. The boy came over to stand before him, hope shining in his eyes. Really? So, what do you do? The doctor chuckled and told him the truth. Oh, I just make it up as I go along. <laughs> the boy wilted at this response. That's what I've been doing, and it isn't going as so well. So, what is this hard thing you have to do, eh? The doctor's huge hypnotic eyes bored into the boy. His friends were in danger. The world was in danger, and he needed help. The stranger before him exerted an aura of kindness, so he decided to risk a little more information. The boy looked around to verify they were alone before continuing. He sat heavily back on, down and folded his arms across his knees. I have to defeat the most fire, powerful firebender in the world, but I don't know how. It clicked. There was only one person that could. this could be. The doctor sighed and removed his hat. Such a heavy burden, even for an old soul. It was no wonder the boy couldn't sleep. Poor little chap. Wherever the Time Lord sent him no longer mattered. This was why he was here. Ah, uh, I see. The doctor sat down but next to the boy and crossed his legs. That is a hard thing to deal with indeed. And it's even worse than that, the boy continued, clearly obsessed. I think I'm supposed to kill him, but the monks taught me that all life is sacred. Even if I could kill him, I don't know if I can make it myself do it. The boy put his head in his hands. Please, doctor, tell me what to do, he said, speaking into his lap. I'm sorry, my dear boy, the doctor said lowly, understanding voice. I can't tell you that what to do, but I can tell you a story to pass the time a bit. The young airbender looked up at his strange companion. Once, not so long ago, I had to do something I thought was wrong too. In that situation, though, I thought I had to kill an entire race, rather than a specific person. The voice, the boy's eyes widened. Uh, a whole race? Yes. The Time Lord confirmed solemnly, as if I had to wipe out every last human being on Earth, or, uh, last. Uh, he quickly flipped through his thoughts to summon the correct name. Ostrich hordes? A buzzard wasp? Well, most people wouldn't mind it if you got rid of a buzz wa buzzard wasp. That's exactly what everyone thought about these beings. I was sent to destroy, for they were destined to become the most pure, pitless race of conquerors the universe would ever know. What were they called? The boy asked, in fear and wonder. At the time, they had no name. They were just defenseless, slimy little creatures in a madman's laboratory. You mean they were made, created in some way? That's terrible. Why would someone do such a horrible thing? That is a long story, much longer than the, we have time to, for now. But the main point is that I knew that they were that if these creatures were su allowed to survive, they would grow up to destroy countless worlds and put countless more into slavery, including the world where most of my friends lived, a world very much like your own. So did you do it? 
the boy asked, in a small voice, clearly afraid of the answer and implications. It had, for his own struggle. No, the doctor replied. I found another way, but it wasn't perfect. The boy breathed in a sigh of relief. How did you stop them? Then, I didn't. I just delayed them for a long time. So they survived to be all those bad things? Yes, but not for a thousand ye of years. When they did manage, it was to a much stronger universe that was in much better position to oppose them. Still, I failed to change their basic character. And yes, much of the destruction they reached, wreaked, remained unaltered, I'm afraid. Do you regret not killing them? The boy asked. Contency, once again tense. The Time Lord blew out a breath, another large breath. Sometimes, he admitted. Like I said, the solution wasn't perfect. You'll find if you ha haven't already, Aang, there are no easy answers to life. The cheerful alien paused in regards. His young companion here was one of the few beings who could remember past lives as he could. He had met the Avatar long ago as a young girl named Irulian in a city, a secret garden called West Portal. West Portal. She and her garden had perished. Her eyes... He closed his eyes, a cloud passing over his face at the memory. I want to find another way, Doctor, the young airbender continued. So intent on his training, he a thought that he failed to notice his companion change of address. I really do, but what if I can't? Um, the Time Lord prompted, disturbed from his revere. Oh, nonsense, of course you can. You just haven't found it yet, that is all. But no matter what I learn or where I do, I can't seem to figure out what to do when I finally face him. Well, the elder man replied with a laugh, you might not be able to figure it out until the moment comes. Opportunity is often like that, my dear old friend. It knocks a at its own convenience. The boy looked down case. I'm sorry, Doctor, but that doesn't really help. No, of course not. It doesn't, he readied, readily admitted. But it's often true. Besides, consider the alternative. Either you move, move forward and face the challenge, or... Or what? His large eyes bugging out suggestively. Surrender? The red swat of the airbender looked up at the doctor inside. That's not really an option. Well, of course not! The, uh, the Time Lord agreed, empathetic. If I lo surrender or I lose, I'll never see my friends again. They'll just be killed or turned into slaves. I can't let that happen. The boy averted his eyes from the doctor's piercing blue orbs. I can't let that happen to them, he repeated, his voice sagging with exhaustion. Can't let that happen to her. Ah, yes, a special friend, I think. You see, the doctor congratulated him with a broad smile. You have all the motivations you need, young man. I haven't in the slightest doubt that saying will work out just fine. What, what do you mean? The boy asked, lifting his head. It looked once again w into his companion, and... Well, the curly-haired traveler replied with a twinkle in his eyes. It's good to be noble and try to save the world, but it never it's never as powerful as when you need to protect someone important to you. The young man considered this for a moment. You're right. I am doing this for the world, but mostly, I think about the people closest to me. Do you have someone like that? The question stabbed. The doctor cursed himself for walking headlong into this obvious trap. A memory of unbidden swallowed in him whole. Suddenly, he was walking down the athletic lane towards the nu nuclear power plant she had followed even when he had told her to stay behind, stay safe. She wore an Andy Pandy outfit, 
She bounced along behind him. She was adorable. I worry about you, she said when he finally acknowledged her presence. Besides, I'm from Earth and you're not. Yes, but... Oh, but what? I worry about you. The memory faded, and only the t faintest scent of her linger hair lingered. He looked over to his young friends. Yes, Aang, I do, and that's why... That's why I know you won't fail. The doctor stood up. It was time to go. Hey! The boy cried as he followed suit. How did you know my name? The Time Lord looked into the boy's eyes, illuminating by the starlight, and smiled. We met a long time ago, Aang. In a different life. For both of us. Aang looked the elder man by his hand. But, but, can't you stay? You could, you know, tell me about your past. Maybe help me. No, yet, my young man, old friend, the Time Lord said gently, extracting himself from the young man's grip. This isn't my story, not this time. The doctor smiled and placed a few jelly bellies in the young man's hand. Travel broadens the mind, as they say, so I'm off. He jammed his hat back on the mop of an unruly curls. But I think we'll meet again. Aang smiled, tried but glad he to have met a new old friend. He put the candies in his mouth, but as he chewed, his smile, smile faltered. But wait, how do I know you're not just another hallucination? The elder man expression turned wistful. Ah... Well, you don't, do you? Maybe since you swallowed the evidence. But don't worry. You can always ask Appa or Momo. Suddenly they laughed. Aang bowed. Thank you, Doctor. I'm not sure if I might fall asleep yet, but I think you helped me somehow. The Doctor bowed and returned and walked back to the police box in the clearing behind him. Moments later, the Avatar was alone watching the stars in the silence.